two weeks ago, we looked at all the comparisons uh, that uh, uh, the writer makes in, in this chapter. And in that, we discovered that there were seven of them. And so these are things that are better. It says that honor is better than luxury. Death is better than birth. Mourning is better than feasting. Sorrow is better than laughter. Rebuke is better than praise. Patience is better than pride. And then wisdom is better than wealth. That's the first major section in chapter 7. There's two other sections of things. There's the section that uh, contains all the warnings. And that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, Four separate warnings uh, that uh, the preacher gives to us in this chapter. And they're all preceded by the words, uh, do not. Now next week, we'll look at his observations. But this morning, let's focus in on the warnings from this chapter. The first warning given by the preacher is the warning, do not react when you can respond. Look at verse number 9. He says, do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. Being quick-tempered is the behavior of of a fool. Those who are easily provoked when things do not go their way react quickly, and in reacting quickly, they reveal their pride rather than patience. Some people are quick to get angry with God when, when their desires and their expectations aren't fully met in their timing or in the way that one might expect. And so some people will be quick to get angry at God. When catastrophic events or when unforeseen incidents interrupt their plans, it is the fool that is quick to blame God for the interruption and the delay. And in their pride, they refuse to humble themselves. They refuse to trust and obey God with all that they are and all that they have. Now for others, rather than being quick to get angry with God, some people are quick uh, to get angry at those that are around them. Some people are easily provoked at the shortcomings of others. Uh, And so they tend to uh, be quick to flare up in their anger because someone else does something that displeases them. In such cases, it is their pride that leads them to think that they have the right to react in the way that they react. But remember, being quick-tempered is the behavior of a fool. God's Word stresses the importance of controlling our attitudes and controlling our reactions. We must always be sure uh, that our anger does not lead us to sin. We must always guard ourselves against the temptation to be quick-tempered. God's Word declares in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 26, it says, Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And then it says in James chapter 1, verse number 19, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And then one more place we find in Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 32. There it says, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. You see, if we're not careful, we can have the tendency to jump to conclusions. When we jump to conclusions, we often make the mistake of rendering a verdict without hearing all or considering all of the information at hand. I mean, has anyone been guilty of doing this? Rushing to judgment before hearing the full details or knowing the the, the full story of something? I mean, how many of our relationships have been damaged because we were too quick to react? 
How many relationships have we destroyed because we failed to take the time to try to understand the actions of others or we failed to allow for an adequate opportunity for an explanation to be given and to be received rather than trying to gain an understanding Sometimes it is the fool who is quick to race to judgment and and render a verdict without obtaining all of the information. So the first warning that we see in chapter 7 is to do not react when you can respond. There's a better way. Slow down. Be calm. Be patient. Take Take the information in. Allow time to process it so that you can respond in a way that honors and glorifies God rather than reacting in a way that reveals our our pride and leads us to sin. Now, the second warning given by the preacher is found in verse number 10. There in verse 10 it says, Do not say, Why is it that the former days were better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask about this. So the second warning is the the warning, uh, do not dwell upon the past. Do not dwell on the past. Now, looking to the past is is, a true biblical perspective. It's helpful. The Bible commands us to look to the past. Places like Isaiah chapter 46, verse number 8 and 9 says, Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. There is an, a sense that we are called and commanded to remember and to recall things from the past. The Lord's Supper is rooted in this reality. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 24 and 25 says, And when he had given thanks... He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. May you understand that it is one thing to reflect and to remember things from the past. It is another thing to be so fixated and focused on the past that it causes us to make unhealthy or unwise comparisons between our present circumstance and uh, past events. Other than to give God thanks and, and also to remind ourselves of His provi- uh, providential care. Other than that, we are not to dwell upon the past blessings. To do so is to blind ourselves about what God is doing in our lives at the present moment. It is far easier for us to look back and to see what God has done than it is for us to discover and to discern what God is doing in our present circumstances. So when life becomes stressful, when life becomes demanding or particularly challenging, some of us groan about our present circumstances, and in that groaning we yearn for those good old days. The preacher warns us, that it is both unwise and unprofitable to live our lives in the past. It is foolish to to long for times that cannot be relived and cannot be recaptured. The past is a pleasant place to visit, but, but dwelling there instead of living in the present results in a life that is wasted and unwise. Yesterday is gone. It cannot be changed. Tomorrow is distant, and it may not even arrive. Therefore, we are to make the most of the current situation and the current moment that we are living in. The God who was faithful yesterday is the God who will be faithful today. 
And we live in a world that is continually changing. We live in a time when our circumstances can change in a blink of an eye. You never know what, what's on the other end of the, the phone call or the text message that you receive. But may you know that God never changes. Never changes. Psalm chapter 100 declares, it says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And His faithfulness to all generations. Therefore, we are not to be so fixated upon the past, but we're to understand what God is doing right here and right now. And we are to fully submit and surrender our lives unto Him so that we might be used by Him for His glory and for the strengthening of His church. And he gives us a third warning. The preacher continues Going down to verse number 16, the third warning is for us not to be extreme. Do not be extreme. Verse 16 says, Do not be excessively righteous. and Do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? Do not be excessively wicked. And do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Now some people have foolishly taken these verses uh, to believe that, that the preacher is trying to teach a moderation in everyday life. Some people have foolishly taken these verses to, and tried to interpret them as uh, he, him saying, uh, don't be too righteous, ah, but don't be too great a sinner either. But that's not what he's saying in this context. In the Hebrew text, the verbs in verse number 16 carry the idea of reflective action. What means, what he's saying is, don't claim to be righteous and don't claim to be wise. In other words, the preacher's giving us a warning about self-righteousness. Grammatically speaking, the form of the verbs in verse number 16 refers to someone who is only pretending to be righteous. Therefore, the person that the preacher has in mind does not have true holiness that comes by faith, but no, only they have a, a hypocritical holiness that, that comes from works. And so in response to this, the preacher warns us not to be self-righteous. When you think too highly of yourselves, resting and relying on your own righteousness, then it is easy for us to say, I don't deserve to be treated like this. And from there, it is a very short step from us beginning to say things like, who does God think He is? Or what does God think that He's doing? And so the preacher cautions us not to be, as it were, too righteous. This is not to, to say uh, that we should be unrighteous. <laughs> no, that's not what he's saying at all. In fact, he warns us about this mistake in verse number 17 when he tells us not to be too wicked. Verse 17, Do not be excessively wicked and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? His point is not that it's okay for us to be a little bit wicked. He's not saying... I got it. Excessive wickedness? No. Uh, slight wickedness? Yeah, okay, that's not so bad. That's not what he's saying at all. He, he's, not, he's saying that there's not some level of acceptable sin. When it comes to sin, even a little is too much. That's not his point. 
His point is saying that there is great danger in giving ourselves over to evil. It is one thing for an individual to sin from time to time, as everyone does. The preacher says so much by the time you get to verse number 20. Look at verse 20. He says, surely there's not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. So it's one thing to sin from time to time, but there's a world of difference between committing the occasional sin and making a deliberate decision to pursue a lifestyle of sin and deception. Sin never ends with a positive result. Never. Don't forget the exhortation given to us by James in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. There it says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So so in this warning, the preacher is giving the sermon that there are two extremes that he is warning us against. He's warning us uh, of the extreme and the temptation uh, to pursue self-righteousness. And and he's warning us about the temptation for an all-out pursuit of unrighteousness. And both of these errors will lead to destruction. They may ultimately even lead to an untimely death. But there's a way to avoid both of these dangers. And he gives us the solution in the text. The way to avoid these dangers is to live in the fear of God. The preacher says in verse 18, it is good that you grasp one thing and also not let go of the other. For the one who fears God comes forth with both of them. Don't allow that last part to confuse you. That's why I always recommend that you read and study the Bible with multiple trusted translations so that when you get to a point that seems confusing, go to those other trusted translations and see how they render the verse. And then if you'll read through multiple trusted translations, then you'll have a better idea of what he's saying. So so my text says, for the one who fears God comes forth with both of them. Other translations say it like this. Whoever fears God comes out from both of them. Whoever fears God will avoid both extremes. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. And then the other is whoever fears God will escape them all. And so what we see here is that for the third time in the book of Ecclesiastes, To this point, the preacher has encouraged us to walk in the fear of God. The first time, it goes back to chapter 3, verse number 14. There he says, I know that everything God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it, and there is nothing to take from it. For God has so worked that men should fear Him. The second time, we find it in chapter 5, verse number 7. It says, For in many dreams and in many words there is emptiness. Rather, fear God. Now, now this verse can be difficult to understand, but, but the preacher tells us to grasp one thing and not let go of the other. And so, looking back at the advice that he just gives us in verses 16 and 17, now we can begin to understand what he's saying. So when he says to grasp one thing and not let go of the other, he's talking about what he just mentioned about in verses 16 and 17. May you understand that when it comes to our character, when it comes to our conduct, the right way for us to live is to live in fear of God. The the right way to possess and keep hold of true righteousness and true wisdom 
is for us to walk daily in the fear of God. Notice that in verse number 18, that the person who fears God will avoid both extremes. The fear of God is one of the great themes of the second half of the book of Ecclesiastes. We, we've reached that turning point. The first half, he talks about how uh, life, the vanity of life that's being lived under the sun, right? Now we get to the second half. In the second half, he's now uh, pursuing and encouraging us to live and to walk in the fear of God. By the time we get to the end, in chapter 12, verse number 13, he's going to instruct us to fear God. And keep His commandments. Here, tells us to fear God that we might escape His judgments. To fear God. What does that mean? What does that look like? How do we understand what that's asking from us? Well, to fear God, yes, absolutely. It includes things and concepts of having a deep respect for God. To fear God means that we stand in awe and admiration over who He is, what He's done, what He's doing, and what He promises to accomplish. To fear God means to respect His mighty and awesome power. It means that we trust His sovereign rule and reign over all creation. To fear God means that we submit ourselves to His divine authority. Oh, that we would remember the counsel of Psalm chapter 37. In fact, let's look at that. Turn with me. Just go to the right, if you will. Uh, go to Psalm chapter 37. I said to the right. I meant to the left. Go back. Psalm chapter 37. Turn your Bibles there. This is a psalm of David when he talks about the security of those who trust in the Lord. And he also talks about the insecurity of the wicked. Psalm chapter 37, it's not terribly long. But let's look at some of it, if not all of it. It says in verse number 1, Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious towards wrongdoers. For they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourselves in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him and He will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. I think that might resonate with some of you who are restless, who are anxious, who are uptight. The command is to rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evildoers. But evildoers will be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Yet a little while, the wicked man will be no more. And you will look carefully for his place, and he will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes at him with his teeth. And the Lord laughs at him, for he sees his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and bent their bow to cast down the afflicted and the needy, to slay those who are upright in conduct. Their sword will enter their own heart and their bows will be broken. I look for the break in, in the text to kind of skip you ahead a little bit, but there, there's none. It's so good. Better is a, a little of the righteous 
than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord sustains the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their inheritance will be forever. They will not be ashamed in the time of evil. In the days of famine, they will have abundance, but the wicked will perish. And the enemies of the Lord will be like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. The wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is gracious and gives. For those blessed by Him will inherit the land, but those cursed by Him will be cut off. The steps of the man are established by the Lord, and He delights in His way. When He falls... He will not be hurled headlong because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. Mm. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. All day long he is gracious and lends, and his descendants are a blessing. Look at verse 27. Depart from evil and do evil. Good. I mean, it reminds me of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. That you are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which He prepared in advance for you to do. So He says, depart from evil and do good, so that you will abide forever. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake His godly ones. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdoms, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. The wicked spies upon the righteous and seeks to kill him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand or let him be condemned when he is judged. Wait. For the Lord and keep his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land when the wicked are cut off you will see it we're almost done look at verse 35 I've seen a wicked violent man spreading himself like a luxuriant tree in its native soil then he passed away and lo he was no more I sought for him but he could not be found Mark the blameless man, and behold the upright. For the man of peace will have posterity, but transgressors will be altogether destroyed. The posterity of the wicked will be cut off, but the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him oh we have a mighty god we need not worry about what's to come all we need to do is to submit ourselves unto his holiness and his righteousness and give our lives completely unto him and we can trust that he knows what he's doing as we seek to walk in faithful obedience unto Him. Going back to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, there's a a final warning given by the preacher. The final warning is, do not be over-sensitive. Do not be over-sensitive. In these verses, we're going to find some biblical counsel that ought to be better known and ought to be more frequently followed. I mean, it is excellent advice and guidance. Look at verse 21. Also, do not take seriously all words which are spoken, so that you will not hear your servant cursing you. For you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. Earlier in the chapter, the the preacher praised the value of receiving rebuke from the wise. That goes back to verse number 5. But here in verse number 21, 
He, he notes that one might also hear negative comments from others, negative comments from servants, negative comments from those that are under one's authority, those that were obligated to show respect. In order to fully understand and to completely appreciate what the preacher is trying to say here, we must understand the culture and the context that this is given. For the original hearers, the lower social status of slaves and servants would have implied a lesser degree of wisdom and intelligence. Making their complaints, making their criticism, making their cursing less likely to be just and accurate. And therefore, less necessary to take to heart. Nevertheless, some people are easily wounded by each and every critical remark that is spoken regardless of the source. It is so easy to see how helpful these verses are, especially in the age of social media. Every critical tweet, every negative post, every divisive blog comment does not require a response. Instead of falling prey to such hypersensitivity, uh, the, the preacher counsels a, an application of the golden rule by reminding the hearers that they too have casually cursed other individuals. And so if we do not want other people to take great offense at every remark that we've ever made about them, then we shouldn't be taking offense at every remark that we hear about ourselves. So, these verse serves as a reminder that we often practice what we condemn in others. And Paul addresses this issue back in Romans chapter 2. In verses 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, you have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourselves. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourselves, that you will escape the judgment of God? The preacher is trying to tell us that the wise way to deal with the negative comments that are coming not from wise rebuke, like he addresses in verse 5, but the, the best way to deal with the negative comments and the harsh criticisms from other people is to ignore them. Simply don't pay attention to every word that people say. And so the scene he depicts is, is one who is listening in on the conversations of others. It's the eavesdropper. Listening in, trying to find out what other people are, are trying to say. And, and so what the preacher is trying to say is that the wise way to respond is not to be so concerned about it. Stop listening to it. Stop eavesdropping in on other people's conversations. Stop returning back to those same posts, those same blogs, to try to see what else they're saying about you or about others. Stop returning to the source of slander. Just move on. Let it go. The preacher tells us the sad truth. That some people will always talk about other people. This stinging truth slaps us in the face for we ourselves are often guilty of criticizing and gossiping about others as they are guilty of criticizing and gossiping about you. A few texts 
to help encourage us. Proverbs 15, verse 4. A soothing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. James 3, verse 8 tells us, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Proverbs 18, verse 21 it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And then in Matthew chapter 12, verse number 36, Jesus says, but I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. So you don't need to respond. Just ignore it. Just move on. And know that in the end, Jesus will take care of those careless words that have been spoken. And if we are wise, then we'll make sure that our own words pass a few very simple tests before we dare to speak. Tests like, would I say this if the person was standing right in front of me? Are my words bringing life or are they producing death? Is what I'm about to say, am I saying it for the building up of someone else? Am I saying it for the glory of God? Just because something may be true doesn't necessarily mean it must be said. Be careful with our words. Know that there is power in the tongue. Don't be careless. And always be forgiving when others are careless with their tongues. And if we're wise, we'll follow the instructions given to us in Titus chapter 3, verse number 2. It's my last verse, and then I'm done. Titus 3, verse 2, tells us to speak evil of no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. So speak evil of no one, be peaceable, be gentle, and show every consideration for all men. So there we have it. The four warnings. First one, do not react when you can respond. The second one, do not be extreme, or do not dwell in the past. Do not be extreme, and then do not be oversensitive. Oh, may the Lord help us to understand these warnings and live life properly in light of these warnings. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of looking at your word. God, help us to honor you with our words and with our actions. And God, may we fully submit and surrender our lives unto you in this room, in this moment, there are struggles, fears, frustrations, pain. Father, I pray that your spirit would move, give us comfort, guidance, and assurance to walk in faithful obedience to who you are and what your word calls from us. In this time of response, Father, may sins be confessed and repented from, decisions be made, commitments extended, whatever needs to happen in this moment, Father, make it happen. Help us. In Christ's name I pray, amen.